Well, hello, everyone. It's about 4 o'clock Eastern Time, and you know what time that is. It's time for Student Affairs Live. That's right. Your Student Affairs show is back. We're back on the air. We've been off for a month, so we're back from our hiatus. We're really excited. We had a great October, and we're excited for November. My name is Eric Stoller, the host of Student Affairs Live. I'm wearing a special cardigan today, the first time ever, so it's the edition of cardiganisms today, I guess, for Student Affairs Live. We're really excited about today's show. Got a great guest, all sorts of stuff to talk about, and I am stoked. As always, folks, if you have a question for us, you have something to say, put it up on Twitter, use the hashtag pound sign essay live and we will see it we'll respond to your questions we'll read your insights and we're really excited to engage with you as always want to put a quick shout out to our network higher ed live that's right student affairs live is part of the higher ed live network tweeting for us today will be the awesome rachel luna hammer she's tweeting as at higher ed live so follow that account for all sorts of information informative tweets etc etc we are commercial free. That's right, commercial free on Ustream thanks to our sponsor. That's right, our sponsor. Our sponsor is Integral, and they are the creators of the Schools app on Facebook. Be sure to check out their webinar series about how they can help you leverage Facebook to increase yield and retention. And that happens Wednesdays at 2 o'clock Eastern, and we're sending out a tweet with that link right about now. Oh my goodness, folks, it's been forever since we've been on the air. I gotta tell you, I'm a little rusty. I got all kinds of stuff going on here. I kind of feel like Scotty on the Starship Enterprise, holding it all together, giving it all she's got. So here we go. It's time for a little something I like to call challenge and support. My homage, if you will, to one of our favorite student development theorists, Nevitt Sanford. It's the news, Student Affairs Live News Edition. So let's jump into it right away. Many of you may be following some of the Occupy This, Occupy That movements that are taking place in various cities around the world. And I thought it was an interesting article from uh, the folks over at ccnewsnow.com, that's Community College News, uh, about a community college professor who was hosting classes during Occupy Seattle, teaching a whole bunch of things like um, the language of MLK, how to write a position statement, some history of the labor movement. So I thought it was really interesting because, you know, you don't sort of see that kind of teaching on the fly during movements, during, you know, protests. So I thought that was a really cool article, really something interesting to take a look at. Folks, a lot of times I get asked questions around student affairs and technology. It happens all the time. And one of my favorite resources is EDUCAUSE. And so I wanted to just share EDUCAUSE. Uh, it's EDUCAUSE.edu. Great site, lots of information. And they just came out with their latest edition of the EDUCAUSE Review, which is one of their publications. It is chock full of great stories, all sorts of resources, and, and you really have to take a look at it because it's just awesome. And it's higher education and technology, and Student Affairs isn't there yet. So please feel free to take a look at EDUCAUSE. Switching gears, uh, obviously in the news this week and, and last week, there was a lot going on with what's going on with Penn State. Uh, the article from Yahoo kind of says it all. Um, the Joe Paterno is set to retire uh, at the end of the football season. Now, whether or not you like college football, whether or not you don't, it doesn't really matter. The interesting point of this, and I'm just going to be as brief as possible with this so it doesn't take up all the news, is that what we've heard, what we've seen on the news, is that everything at Penn State is sort of revolving around this, this imagery, this sort of hero image of Joe Paterno. And sort of, I think there's this disconnect between reality uh, of who he is as a person who is flawed, uh, like all of us, versus sort of this person who's set up on a pedestal. And what I think has happened with PSU is a lot of folks are traumatized by what's going on. And really, in, in this host's opinion, uh, retirement shouldn't be the option. He should really just, Paterno should really just step down immediately because uh, he knew something that was going on and he may have administratively acted correctly, but morally and ethically he, he didn't. And I think it's pretty fair to say that everyone who has commented on this uh, issue at Penn State feels pretty much the same way. So uh, if you want really a kind of a good roundup, good summary of what's going on at PSU right now, take a look at that article from Yahoo. So I saw this article on .edu Guru. Uh, the folks over there, they had a, a post from Mike Petroff about uh, what's happening with Google Plus. And Google Plus just launched pages for brands. And so it's sort of like the equivalent of a profile, but for a brand. 
And I'll, some colleges are jumping in right away, sort of the early adopters are getting in there. And I think it's interesting uh, just from the point of view that it's, it's the kind of thing folks are going to put their energy into, but whether or not it's actually going to have a lot of return or reward uh, will be interesting. I think that Google is really making a major play with Google+. Plus, uh, and the way they're going to do that, I think, is through search. They're giving folks who engage with Google+, Plus a leg up when it comes to search engine optimization in many ways, especially with that whole uh, Google+, Plus Direct Connect. Uh, that, that Mike Petroff mentions in his post. So, so take a look at that. I thought that was really interesting what they're, what they're doing there uh, when it comes to Google Plus and uh, higher education. Another tidbit here as I transition as my mouse makes its click. Apparently Bluetooth is a little slow today. Uh, ED Universe launched yesterday, last night. Uh, at least the idea did. The site hasn't launched yet. I think it's going to launch in February of 2012. Uh, but it's brought to us from the folks uh, at M. Stoner, which is a new media web company, uh, communications, marketing, et cetera, and they do it, their clientele is mostly higher education. Uh, and it's kind of a portal, kind of a hangout for those of us that are always kind of constantly engaging with one another, looking for information. Uh, and, and I wrote up a little post uh, on Inside Higher Ed about this, but I think it's got uh, a lot of potential for us to create sort of the community that we've always wanted when it comes to sort of the Marcom, higher ed, PR, graphic design, web folks. Uh, so, so definitely take a look at that when it launches. If you go to uh, www.eduniverse right now, uh, you can actually sign up for the beta once it comes out. From the folks at the Lumina Foundation, I thought this was really cool. This comes from Diverse Issues in Higher Education. But the Lumina Foundation is giving organizations and colleges that are building a pipeline of Latino students and promoting college completion, uh, if they're doing this, there's this opportunity to get a $600,000 grant for each institution, which is a lot of cash. So, you know, kudos to the Lumina Foundation for really stepping up and delivering uh, some, some legitimate monies uh, to support Latino student um, retention, admission, recruitment uh, in higher education. So I think that's, that's a really awesome thing that they're doing, and that's courtesy of diverse issues in higher education. All right, folks, since this is my show, Student Affairs Live, I always like to do a little shout out of the week. That's right, an unsolicited shout out of the week. And I was thinking, who am I going to do it with this week? Well, you know, it could be a person, a place, a service, a company, etc. So what's the shout out going to be? And I thought, you know what? Let's give it to the good folks at M Stoner. That's right. The folks at M Stoner for putting out and creating ED Universe this week get my unsolicited shout out of the week because what they're doing is super cool. And I can't wait to see how it goes. I think it's going to be a really neat launch, a really cool service. And they're doing this as sort of their 10-year anniversary uh, as a gift to us. So I'm really stoked about that. And I think that uh, they do good work. They're kind of humble in a way, which is interesting for sort of a marketing communications company. But I'm okay with that, and I actually appreciate that. So uh, unsolicited shout out of the week goes to the folks at M. Stoner. By the way, their president, co-creator, partner, etc. His name's Michael Stoner. That's where the name comes from, just in case you cared. And no, I'm not going to start calling myself E. Stoller just to be uh, cool like the rest of those folks. All right, we have an awesome show today. Awesome guest. Our pre-show conversation yesterday, we could have talked for like eight days, but we couldn't because that would just be theoretically impossible. But let me give you a quick rundown here of Shane, who's going to be on the show as I unmute him so if he can talk over his bio, he can if he wants to. So, folks, today my guest is Shane Windmeyer. He's a leading author on gay campus issues. He's a national leader in gay and lesbian civil rights, and he's a champion for LGBT issues on college campuses. He is co-founder and executive director of Campus Pride, which is the only national organization for student leaders and campus organizations working to create a safer college environment for LGBT students. And he's an author, too. He's written some books. He's, he's all over the place. He speaks for Campus Speak. The guy is a, a machine. He's everywhere. So without further ado, Shane, welcome to Student Affairs Live. Hey, Eric. It's great to be here. Thanks for coming on the show. I, I'm really excited. I think we've got a lot to talk about. As I was putting out in the, the sort of pre-show Twitter ads, I was saying ROTC, Elmhurst Admissions App, Lady Gaga, you know, the normal <laughs> stuff that we talk about. Of but, course, of course. So I guess if you could start off, just maybe explain kind of the work that you do and, and what exactly is Campus Pride, because I think a lot of folks need to know about this organization. 
Yeah. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, first of all, I appreciate being a guest on your show. I, I think it's fabulous. Um, and, and Campus Pride has been around for, for 10 years now. We actually celebrated our 10-year anniversary this past September. Um, and, and so we're very excited about that. Um, you know, I have a master's in student affairs uh, from Indiana University. And, and leadership development and young people have always been uh, my passion. Um, and I recall, you know, coming out in the mid '90s uh, in Kansas, of all places, uh, not really having a lot of support resources. Uh, you know, being gay and being on a small rural campus, and so uh, you know, Campus Pride was about creating those resources for um, LGBT, lesbian, gay, bi, and trans uh, college students who who are from areas that may not have the support. And so, you know, Campus Pride's mission is to create safer. Uh, more LGBT friendly colleges and uh, to build leadership amongst LGBT and, and straight ally teens. And, and so I'm very proud of that and I'm very proud of the organization and the, the many volunteers that we have that work in higher ed across the country. That's awesome. I mean, it's, you were telling me, you know, like, was it thir it's 13%, right, of, of institutions in, in colleges and universities across the country have a Pride Center or some sort of official presence? Uh, Actually, about 13% 13, uh, 13 of uh, colleges have sexual orientation as part of their non-discrimination statement. Okay. Um, and, and about uh, only, I mean, we're talking about less than 10%, about 7 or 8% oh, okay. actually have institutional support uh, for LGBT students. And so that's kind of shocking to a lot of people that only about 7 8% uh, of our colleges, uh, two-year and four-year, actually have uh, any type of institutional support. Which I think uh, is, you know, the perception is that it's a lot higher. Yeah. Oh, definitely. When I published my um, my last book, The Advocate College Guide, which looked at the 100 best colleges and universities, people were, you know, assuming that every college is gay friendly and that, you know, colleges are this bastion of, um, of progressiveness and of LGBT inclusivity. And what we found in our, our research that we published last fall uh, was that, you know, by and large, colleges are, are still behind uh, when it comes to policies that are inclusive of their LGBT students, faculty, and staff. Um, and, and the institutional support uh, is just one, uh, you know, one th way to look at that, I guess. Right. And, well, speaking of inclusivity, what's going on with Elmhurst? Well, you know, Elmhurst College um, did something that we're quite proud of. Uh, Campus Pride, for a number of years, uh, has... Um, really try to encourage more visibility when it comes to our LGBT students. Um, I look back into the, you know, the 90s when I was going to college and, and I felt invisible as a gay uh, young person. And today we have much more uh, visibility when it comes to gay, lesbian. Uh, you know, we're making progress for bisexual students and, and, and a little bit of progress for our transgender students. There's still a long way to go though. And um, Elmhurst College is the first undergraduate college that Campus Pride is aware of to actually ask about LGBT identity on its college admission form. And it's a demographic question, it's optional, meaning that a student doesn't have to answer it. It's you know right around the questions about ethnicity and race and, and it asks about LGBT identity. Um, and so it, it kind of made people think twice, like why don't we do that? Uh, what's wrong with that? Um, you know, it's an optional question. Um, does that allow the college to be more intentional with its services and its programs and with taking responsibility for its students? Well, it seemed like they, they got an interesting amount of dialogue uh, around that, the college did. And I, I think that what you were telling me yesterday that their president actually wrote sort of a, a, a follow-up to an op-ed piece. Yeah, yeah. The president of Elmhurst actually wrote a very, um, I thought, touching and, and very, um, uh, I, I, very, very thoughtful uh, op-ed piece about why not ask the question. Um, you know, they, they spend a lot of time as a college saying, you know what, we, we do outreach to many other populations, uh, our ethnic, uh, our racial, our cultural students. Um, you know, we reach out to international students. We reach out to student athletes uh, through admissions. Why not reach out to lesbian, gay, bi, and trans students? Um, and, and it was a very intentional and thoughtful op-ed piece uh, that he was responding um, kind of his own remarks. Um, and so we were very proud of that. We're very proud of Elmhurst College. Uh, we feel as an organization that more colleges need to exercise responsibility on the front end of the college admission process in accepting and, and you know, getting LGBT students. Absolutely. Well, and, and you know, they're not part of the Common App, too. I know that was part of this in terms of, you know, the Common App folks were sort of saying, we're not going to change 
Yeah, you know, we lobbied the Common App, you know, as a national nonprofit organization. We were trying to get the Common App to encourage, because there was a number of schools like Dartmouth and Penn uh, that have done some really progressive things through college admissions, um, but they had never went to the step of asking an optional demographic question. So, you know, Campus Pride tried, tried for a number of years with uh, a couple other organizations, uh, the consortium being one of them, to get the Common App to um, be inclusive with this optional demographic questions. Um, the Common App actually added a question around religion on its main form this past year, but for some reason they thought it was, I guess, too risky or too progressive to add an optional question around LGBT identity. Well, um, do you know, do they ask a question around, around gender? I know that it seems like so many applications just have either F and M, you know, they don't have well, they, any, any right. for, for sort of, you know, everything's sort of got to be on the gender binary. Well, and they do on the front end, and, and that, that was one where we were willing to allow them to continue to ask about gender, but then to ask about gender identity somewhere within the form or, uh, you know, allow a trans student to actually come out as trans uh, if they chose to, um, uh, you know, and, and, and gender identity is very different than when we talk about LGB uh, sexual identity. And so, you know, the forms are important because they send a message along with collecting important data uh, about our students, they send a message of, of what's uh, diverse, what's expected, what's, what's um, you know, in many ways uh, accepted and is part of the diversity of the campus. And so having gay, lesbian, bi, and trans, along with ethnicity and race and religion and all the other optional demographic questions, you know, it sends a message of acceptance to these out LGBT students and, and even the closeted ones that I think is important. Well, hey, Shane, I'm getting a little bit of feedback and I think it might be from your microphone. And ah. let me, I'm just going to uh, go really quickly back to just me for the screen, folks, just so I can hopefully reset uh, Shane's video here. Uh, but I, I have a feeling he's going to come back and be, we'll be just fine here in a second. Anyway, uh, I'm here with Shane Winmeyer. He's of Campus Pride. He's also a speaker who goes around to colleges and universities talking about LGBT issues on campus. And Shane, I, I guess, you know, the one thing that we talked about yesterday that really got my attention was when you started talking about Lady Gaga and her disco stick. All right, Shane, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Eric. I, I must, something must have been wrong with the microphone, like you mentioned. It's okay, and Skype loves to do all kinds of fun things. So uh, I think we're, <laughs> uh, we're back on the air, folks. You know what? When you run a show with Skype, bubblegum, duct tape, and a few other things, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> okay, and I'm getting uh, feedback from Rachel, who is uh, furiously sending me information on GChat that we're back up and ready to go. So I was just about to ask you uh, about what you're doing when you go to college campuses and you talk about Lady Gaga. Well, I think Gaga is a way to um, kind of enter back into this this discussion we were having because you know we were talking about the institutional commitment. And, you know, only, um, like I mentioned, about 8% of our colleges actually have institutional support for LGBT students. And so by institutional support, we're talking about, you know, professionals that as part of their job description, uh, it, it's to support LGBT students, uh, the, the campus life, the diversity of LGBT issues. And, and one of the, the phenomenons, I, I call it the Lady Gaga phenomenon, um, and I, I talk about this on college campuses, but imagine if um, Lady Gaga were to come to your campus, and we all know she has a disco stick, right? Um, and, and imagine if she were to take her disco stick, fly in on her UFO, because she has a UFO somewhere, I'm sure, um, and, and she flies in on her UFO with her disco stick, and Lady Gaga, being the gayrific straight ally she is, um, she zaps up with her disco stick all the gay, lesbian, bi, trans, uh, queer, um, even the straight allies who are passionate, who are doing work on your campus around LGBT issues. Now, these students, faculty, and staff oftentimes are doing this work out of the kindness of their heart. They're doing it because they are passionate. They care about it. They're running the safe zones. They're planning the Pride Week. They're, you know, they're doing a, tons of extra job responsibilities uh, just because they care about this population and they're trying to create a safe place. Imagine if Lady Gaga were to do that. The question then becomes, if all those students, faculty, and staff who are LGBT and queer, if they were to be zapped up, what would be the commitment from the campus to make sure that LGBT issues, um, LGBT people were still part of the campus life, 
we're still part of the diversity, the, the curriculum. Uh, just like our African American students, or Latino students, or our, um, you know, our, our religious students, you know, what ensures that those issues and those topics are still part of the campus? And what we find on most of our campuses is that there's not nothing, there's no responsibility that the campus takes to make sure those issues are part of the dialogue, other than supporting the students. And so. LGBT students and their issues are oftentimes put on the back uh, to shoulder the responsibility on the backs of the LGBT students, uh, the faculty and staff. And, and that's a problem, I think, uh, in 2011, 2012, that we still expect the LGBT students or the faculty staff to basically teach and educate around LGBT issues. We should do that as administrators. We should do a better job of institutionalizing that. Well, and I think that, you know, that, that's a really good point, though, if, if sort of the uber allies and, you know, the LGBT folks on campus were sort of zapped up, you know, <laughs> it's, it's the question I think that happens a lot on campuses is, you know, you've got sort of maybe a chief diversity officer, and don't even get me started about that position, but if that, per, you know, that person sort of becomes the, the target, the one who is, yes, you know, tasked to do uh, the social justice work on behalf of the campus, but then again, one person cannot build a community, tear down walls, you know, create this sort of all-inclusive, equitable environment. So I, I think that, especially for those campuses, like you said, that are in the, gosh, what, 80 plus percentile, uh, you know, that that's a really interesting space to be in. So I think you were talking to me about that you have, through Campus Pride, you all have a camp for advisors. <laughs> Yeah, we actually in the summer um, for the sixth year this July, we have um, what we call Camp Pride. And it's a five day, five night leadership camp uh, that started out for undergraduate students, um, LGBT and ally student leaders. And it's a, it's a social justice camp. Um, it kind of teaches um, LGBT and ally students not only how to be advocates around LGBT issues, but also kind of broader issues of social justice. Um, because we're stronger as an LGBT community when we actually support all communities, uh, whether that be uh, our students of color, our, our different religious students, our international students, you know, our, you know, the immigration issue and standing up for, you know, uh, people regardless of who they are. So we really try to teach that. And this past year, we actually added a boot camp for advisors because what we were finding was we were sending back the students to do action plans uh, and they, they had developed these fabulous uh, policies, programs, and practices they were trying to improve on on their campus, but they were getting back, and their advisor wasn't necessarily, um, you know, they're not typically student affairs folks. Uh, they're biology professors, which I love my biology professor, but they don't necessarily know about LGBT identity I was say, development. Half of our audience are all <laughs> biology professors, so be careful what you say. Well, I, you know, I, there's really good people who help advise our LGBT groups, but they don't necessarily have a, a background in student development or how to support kind of some of these policy and programmatic changes that are necessary. So we created this boot camp in order for students to kind of bring along their advisor so they're on the same page. Uh, with the action plan when they go back to improve their campus. Um, you know, because as I mentioned with the Gaga phenomenon, you know, many campuses, you know, about 90 some percent of our campuses don't have institutional support and only about 13 percent have even a policy that is inclusive of non-discrimination based on sexual orientation. And only about, I think, what, 7 percent have gender identity and expression. So we have a long way to go. Yeah, definitely. Well, and one of the things you, you shared yesterday was that on Campus Pride on the website, there's a link to kind of a ranking system for, yeah. for sort of gay-friendly schools. Could you talk about that? Well, no, that's a really good um, resource, and it's free. So there's there's no excuse for an administrator or for uh, any college not to participate. But, you know, back in 2006 when I published this book called The Advocate College Guide, uh, I also developed at the same time through Campus Pride a national index. Uh, this index is called the Campus Pride Index, uh, the LGBT Friendly Climate Index, um, and it's a national benchmarking tool. Um, I did it with a team of researchers. Um, Sue Rankin uh, from Penn State was on the team. Uh, Jenny Beeman uh, from UMass Amherst is on the team. Uh, Debbie Bazarski from Princeton is on the team. But we, we developed this team of researchers that created uh, uh, basically uh, 55 benchmarking questions around LGBT policies, programs, and practices. Uh, these benchmarking questions look at campus safety. They look at housing and residence life. 
Uh, they look at um, academic student life. Uh, it looks at recruitment and retention work. And so this index is very exhaustive. Um, it went from having 30 colleges when we first launched it back in 2007 to now over 300 colleges have participated and are out online. And, and I, I, I use the term out very intentionally in that we ask our students to come out on campus. We ask our faculty and staff to, you know, come out. You know, if you're gay, lesbian, bi, trans, you know, we want you to be out. Um, well, colleges also need to come out. And this index allows colleges to come out and assess uh, how LGBT friendly they are in their policies, programs, and practices. Um, it allows them to compare uh, to their peer institutions um, in a very intentional, um, responsible way so they can see what they're doing well and the, where they can improve. Um, and we, you know, we link it into our college fair program. Uh, you know, Campus Pride has the only national college fair program that allows colleges to come out and recruit. Uh, and I, again, I use that term very intentionally, you know, they recruit out LGBT and even straight students. Um, believe it or not, Eric, I, I know you, this is hard to believe, but there are straight people who, who want to go to an LGBT friendly campus. Um, well, hell, well, hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like if, if, if it's, if it's a, you know, socially, social justice minded campus, absolutely. I think that, uh, it, it's, it's part of the sales pitch for everyone, right? Well, yeah, and I mean, I um, straight students. There's more and more straight students who have family members who are gay, parents, um, aunts, uncles, you know, who are out, and and they want their topics and their issues and their families to be respected on the campus and to be able to bring their gay brother to family day and not have it be an issue. And so we need to think a little bit more broadly, and we need to be more intentional and responsible uh, as I think student affairs um, as colleges. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so. In, t in terms of colleges and student affairs and sort of, you know, the news of what's going on around, around the country, um, we we're chatting a little bit about NC State. And I missed this news, actually, about NC State. You had mentioned it um, to me, and that was the first time I'd heard about it. But could you talk about what happened at NC State uh, and, and sort of why there's a serious issue there? Well, let's back up a little bit. So sure. what, what happens at North Carolina State um, is, is tragic. It's awful. It, it happens on all of our college campuses. Um, we don't do a good job on our college campus. And, and keep in mind, like I said, I, I had, you know, I worked on a college campus, um, Indiana University, uh, UNC Charlotte was my first job. And um, so I have somewhat of a background and, and I can legitimately say from all the campuses I visited, as well as the campuses where I've had the joy to work, there's room for improvement when it comes to reporting uh, bias incidents and hate crimes. Um, hate crimes are underreported. Uh, bias incidents on our college campuses are mostly not reported. Um, and by a bias incident, what we're talking about are, are incidents that happen that don't rise to the level of a criminal act. Uh, oftentimes, they, they operate under the guise of free speech, uh, which is fine, uh, but they still hurt victims. Um, so the fag joke uh, that happens in a classroom or someone being called the N-word, um, you know, outside the classroom walking one night uh, on campus. Um, or you see, um, you know, a, um, uh, you know, some type of, um, you know, for, for Hanukkah, you, you see, uh, you know, Hanukkah decorations uh, ripped up or torn up. I mean, those types of things send a message, whether they be a hate crime or a bias incident. And so, you know, Campus Pride... Um, our work uh, at NC State um, has been trying to get campuses across the country to realize that when bias incidents happen, we have to take them seriously. And NC State, I don't know if you recall, um, back during the Obama election, um, where Obama was, um, you know, uh, de de uh, declared the winner, that night at NC State's campus, they, they have a tunnel, and, and this tunnel is we have these types of things on all of our campuses, but this tunnel is a place where students cross through to go to another side of the campus. And, um, you know, they could cross above, I believe, um, but they have to go through a couple lanes of traffic. So it's just convenient. And they've deemed it at NC State as a free speech tunnel. Um, and so they allow students to write anything in there. Um, they don't have to reserve it. There's no policy that I'm aware of. Um, it's just free speech. You just go in there and write what you want. And uh, during the Obama election, um, uh, where he was declared the winner, uh, some students had went in there and wrote, um, you know, White House, not Black House. Uh, they used the N-word. Um, 
And the NAACP, there was a national story about this, uh, came in and said, that's a hate crime because it's vandalism and it's biased motive. It's on property. It's on campus property. And the problem was is that NC State had deemed that a free speech area, and they actually allowed students to write whatever they wanted. Um, and, and so it was problematic for the NAACP. It's problematic for the college. And... Um, that's kind of the history of this free speech tunnel. Now, NC State, um, a few weeks ago, um, if you are aware, um, had, um, you know, dye, fag, burn fag, uh, a, a, a crop, um, uh, a mark, uh, all spray painted uh, through the faces of the LGBT staff on the actual door of their LGBT center on campus. And it's, it's an awful... Uh, you know, hate crime. It's vandalism. It's on the property of the school. And, and so, um, you know, campuses have this happen in a variety of ways, whether it be in a bathroom stall or, you know, on the door of their LGBT center. But the question becomes, and I think this is an important free speech question to ask ourselves, is this was probably happening elsewhere on campus. I, I know for a fact it was in some way or another. Um, and it may have been happening in this tunnel, but they allow it in the tunnel so my question then becomes, did it still hurt the LGBT student when they saw it in the tunnel versus when it was on the door of the LGBT right. center? Exactly. And, that, and that's the question I, I just want to you know, talk about, I think, is that is there a responsibility for free speech? And you know, do campuses, in creating free speech, um, which is vitally important, even have a greater responsibility to have respectful and civil dialogue that accompanies that free speech? Well, let's ask folks that are watching. I know we've got some folks that are watching. Let's just say, let's. what do you think? I mean, I think that when you're walking through a tunnel with epithets and hate speech and, you know, fighting words, essentially, um, that's really not, not a good place to have to walk through. And so I, I think that, uh, you know, folks want to maybe tweet in their, uh, their thoughts. I think uh, we'll, we'll definitely take a look here as they, as they come in. Hopefully it doesn't destroy my computer. Sometimes the, uh, the speed of Chrome Deck can take out my bandwidth but i think that you make it a really good point though shane about the fact that yes it was vandalism when it was on the the door and, and through the faces of the staff members yet at the same time in a tunnel it's it's not less hurtful uh so i, I it, what was the response from the folks at nc state have you heard any sort of news reports well, I mean, they, they came together as a community, which was which was uh, really important to do uh, around the vandalism that happened on the LGBT center. And they had a big rally. And I'm sure that they're doing a wonderful stuff. And NC State actually has a very high rating on our index. And so they have some good policies, programs and practices. But I think there's an important lesson to be learned about I think broader issues of free speech because free speech is ultimately everyone's right and it's one of the most important rights on college campuses. But college campuses still can create um, civil and respectful ways for that free speech to happen. And I don't, th I think colleges have shunned away from doing anything with free speech areas because they're just like, free speech is free speech, so go and do it. And I think that's problematic. But um, NC State's a good campus and I'm using it as an example uh, because. Even good campuses have issues and problems that we constantly have to be dealing with. Well, and it's, it's, it's free speech is one of those things that we all, we all re realize that it's extremely important because it, you know, this sort of, it goes both ways. I mean, I, that's why I, the irony sometimes is when fire will take on a case where a university clearly violated someone's free speech and the speech wasn't hurtful or hateful, the university just decided that students couldn't you know, do their, their gathering or their organizing wherever they were located. So I, um, I, I think that it's a really sort of sticky situation, especially with the case law. There isn't a lot of really decent case mm -hmm. law that we can go to, go to when it comes to words can hurt. I think one of my philosophy professors back in grad school said, you know, really, we always say sticks and stones can break my bones, words can never hurt me. But really, you know what, you break my arm, that heals pretty quickly the psychological trauma to when you if you call me names i see imagery that is hurtful epithets etc that's that psychological trauma can take a lot longer to heal from so i i think that's that's kind of we have to shift our cultural norms around how we can really hurt each other well and eric i i in our state of higher ed report that we published last fall uh what we learned was that um over a third of our trans students actually fear for their physical safety on college campuses, um, and and that's also including our faculty and staff. And you know, a quarter 
um, people don't realize this, but a quarter of LGB students um, encounter harassment on their campuses currently. And, and many of the students, faculty, and staff who are LGBT um, actually hide their sexual identity uh, or their gender identity um, as a way to avoid that intimidation. And, and we learned that through our report. Um, and we also learned that students are, um, you know, uh, considering leaving their campus because of the challenging climate. And, and when administrators hear that college students may leave their campus because of the negative harassing environment, that's when you start hearing people kind of listen up and say, oh, really? Um, because it costs more money. Right. You know, when, when, it, when justice gets connected to retention, people <laughs> pay attention. Yeah. You know, because it costs more money to, um, you know, recruit a new student mm-hmm. than it does to retain a current one. Which is, it's really unfortunate that it has to be connected to this sort of school budget like that, uh, the marketing, the image kind of thing. But I think that, you know what, if, if sometimes if that's what it takes folks to pay attention, at least gets people talking about things and gets, starts with some room for dialogue. Definitely, definitely. So one of the things we talked about yesterday is really, you know, I think you're giving a talk uh, maybe next month, next year uh, at Rutgers, one of the Rutgers schools, and we were talking about um, roommate matching and, and what's going on. Could you talk about um, some of the stuff that's going on with schools and, and housing and roommates? Well, yeah. Um, so one of the reasons why we were talking about that is I, I'm, I'm hung up on this visibility issue um, because I, I don't feel that LGBT students are visible uh, on our campuses. And I, I say that realizing that there are many out LGBT students, but to administrators, um, it's responsibility by chance, meaning that because the student got involved with the GSA or the pride group, yeah, they're out and the administrators know about them. But there are many LGBT students who um, are not necessarily involved with something that's LGBT related, but the campus doesn't know about them. And so, you know, we got on this topic of kind of Tyler Clemente and Rutgers um, because I'm, I'm preparing for a speech there uh, next week on one of their campuses. And, um, what I learned was that, um, you know, in preparing for this, uh, you know, I, I was thinking more about kind of forms and, and how our forms, whether it be admission forms, whether it be housing forms or healthcare forms, how we still don't have any visibility for an LGBT student if they chose to, to come out. Um, and I was thinking, you know, with Tyler, you know, some campuses have done roommate matching around LGBT friendly roommates. Uh, they've done theme floors or uh, kind of LGBT living learning communities, uh, not just for LGBT students, but for any student that wants to learn about LGBT issues uh, or social justice for that matter. Um, and, and so I was, you know, I, I think we posed the question yesterday, you know, would it have mattered to someone like a Tyler Clemente if they were able to choose um, an LGBT friendly roommate matching, uh, you know, and would that have made a difference? And it's hard to say things like that now, but there are important questions for us to ask as housing professionals is what can we do to create safe environments where a student sleeps? Uh, Because I used to be under the impression that, you know, we need to put diverse students together and they'll learn from each other because that's what happens when you put them together is that they learn. And the more I realized as a privileged white male, you know, You know, some students um, don't want to educate in their sleep when they're in bed. (laughs) They don't want to educate in their room. You know, maybe they'll educate on campus or in their residence hall, maybe TV room. But why should they have to do that where they sleep at? Right. And so it's that it's that sort of dichotomy of the the, those in privileged groups don't have to know anything, and those in marginalized groups have to know everything about those in the privileged groups. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, I think those are questions that people are asking. You know, I, I don't think there's one answer for any campus per se, but I think the questions need to be asked. I, I think, you know, theme or living learning communities uh, in residence halls are important. I think, you know, roommate matching is is an option that could be explored. I, if education is going to happen on campus, there's plenty of places for it to happen other than my bedroom where I have to sleep in a residence hall. Yeah. Well, and I, I wonder if some of the companies like RoomSync, RoomSurf that are you know, using Facebook to, to match students up based on interest, uh, you know, it's interesting because you know, schools that have traditionally done roommate matching, a lot of it's done behind the scenes, right? It's an administrative function at the school. But if, you, if your school starts to use, let's say you use RoomSync to do roommate matching and it's, all, it's on Facebook, it becomes very public and you, all, you, you essentially would have to out yourself, you know, or not necessarily out yourself, but you could say, you know, hey, 
LGBT LGBT friendly preferred but again other students see that what are they going to do with it so I think it's it's an interesting well, interesting challenge for, for administrators now because it's you know you don't want students necessarily outing themselves who don't want to or not comfortable outing themselves yet at the same time being able to identify and say hey don't really want the phobes to be my roommate thanks oh well yeah I think that's actually an interesting issue Eric is because you know today's young person is coming out in high school they're coming out in middle school um, there's not a lot of research to show yet um, and I say that yet because um, you know, if you look at some of our national research tools, uh, whether it be Nessie or the SERP studies, uh, none of them have optional demographic questions around LGBT identity. Imagine as a profession if our national research tools that we rely on for higher ed information about our students actually added a demographic question about LGBT identity. Imagine how we could compare uh, you know, LGBT students and their experiences or, or what they're encountering to our heterosexual students. And if that would help inform us, oh my, that's a thought, uh, about how to better serve them, right? Exactly. I mean, it, would change uh, pol- it could change policy, <laughs> positional but, funding. But I bring that up because there's this misnomer, and I, I say misnomer because I don't know if I believe it today because there's no research to show it, that LGBT out students in high school would would be afraid to mark something on a form. Uh, there's like this in loco parentis going on about oh, we have to protect the the gay student from being outed, and many of them have been out for five or six years before they even got to to college. Um, and it's even in rural areas. I mean, the young woman in Mississippi. Do you really think she wants to go to a college where she can't take her partner or her girlfriend to prom uh, or to a social event? I mean, she experienced that in high school. Um, so I, I think there's a challenge for our national researchers uh, who are doing these studies that inform us as a profession to say, you know what, it's about time that we include optional demographic questions so we can make informed decisions rather than ones that are just you know, based on what we think from when we went to college you know, 10, 20 years ago. Hey now, hey, hey, when we went to college, <laughs> that was not that long ago. You know? we, we, actually, actually, it was. And, uh <laughs> Growing up in rural Iowa, I can attest that, you know, for folks who were out when I was in high school, it, it was really tough. And, and I, it, it is much better now. It is much m- more improved in terms of actual, you know, GSAs and uh, just, just groups that are a- affirming identity and supporting identity. Was it, the, the, was it a principal or superintendent in, in was it like San Diego area, I think, uh, that, that, you know, was very public about his support for the the homecoming, uh, the king and the queen, or two yeah. women, and he said, "Hey, if you don't like it, that's tough. We're going to support them." Yeah, no, no. There's been and there's been great progress. I I, I think what I want to make sure I, I tone down here is that um, you know for our closeted questioning LGBT students, there's still a lot of need for support and services. But what I'm trying to do is there are many more out students today that simply want to say, hey, I'm gay, and not have to write about it in their college essay uh, for admissions. Um, Penn will actually, if in your college essay you mention that you're gay, they'll actually, uh, you know, help uh, in many ways put you with uh, somebody to answer questions around what that means at Penn. Uh, But why should they have to write about it in their essay? I mean, surely a gay student might have other things they want to write about in their college essay than being gay. So, you know, I get calls from parents all the time about what colleges are LGBT friendly, uh, and I send them obviously to our index. Um, last year, we made about nine thousand referrals uh, to colleges from our index. Uh, but you know, they want to know, you know, should we come out on our admission form? You know, what should he mention that he's gay on the campus visit? You know, all those sorts of things, which sound maybe silly to some people, but for a parent who hear stories about Tyler Clemente and, you know, Jamie Rodmeyer and all these young kids, they just want to find somewhere where their kids can feel comfortable and safe. Absolutely. And I think that it, it, the work that you all are doing through Campus Pride is, is you said 9,000? Yeah, we made 9,000 referrals. That's, um, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, Campus Pride last year um, through our index, um, you know, colleges come out and so they get this really nifty profile page uh, and they're able to add photos of their queer student group and uh, links. And Can they add uh, glitter? Can they, can they add <laughs> any sort of sparkle to the page? Uh, we, we might add that actually as a feature. We'll call it the Stoller feature. Um, that's, that's the button, yeah. <laughs> the Stoller button. And the you'll glitter your page. Stoller bedazzling. There you go. 
<laughs> we're actually looking for a grant right now to do some improvement so you know we could add glittering to the to the um to the grant but yeah but you know there's a book bag and uh, students can actually book bag all the colleges and send them a note saying hey you're gay friendly and i want to know about you so it's kind of cool all right, you caught me. I was reading Twitter here as I was looking at the tweets. <laughs> what I'm finding to be most interesting is the fact that I'm now sitting in the dark because apparently the sun no longer shines over the great state of Massachusetts. Uh, that's what I get for trying to do natural light with this particular show. Uh, so one other thing that we had in sort of our, our show notes was what's going on with, with, with ROTC and college campuses. Uh, you know, with, with, with Don't Ask, Don't Tell sort of, you know, being in existence, sort of being kind of wishy-washy, and then now you've got schools that are saying, hey, ROTC, welcome back. What's what's <laughs> going on with that? Well, you know, um, we first have to recognize that ROTC on many campuses has a, a sordid history beyond just LGBT issues. Um, and so there's a lot of things around ROTC at, like, Harvard that, you know, happened long before the LGBT issue got thrown in there. And... Um, it's somewhat of a non-issue because of the Solomon Amendment. I assume maybe some of your listeners, viewers may know about the Solomon Amendment. But uh, you know, colleges started saying that if uh, ROTC doesn't allow for LGBT people to serve in the military, then they're not going to be able to recruit on our campus. And then Congress basically passed the Solomon Amendment, which said if you don't allow them to recruit, then you're not going to get federal monies or something like that. Um, and so really the only campuses that could really implement a ban on ROTC were the very private, uh, well-funded uh, campuses typically, um, which we're talking about Harvard and Stanford and other places like that. Most public schools still allowed ROTC recruitment by and large. Um, but the larger issue for me um, is that many of these campuses are jumping on the bandwagon of ROTC doesn't discriminate now, the military doesn't discriminate, don't ask, don't tell, is overturned, so let's allow them back on campus. Well, that's not true for our trans students. Um, you know, someone can still be dismissed uh, uh, from the Army, the military uh, service uh, branches, for, um, you know, being trans uh, because of their gender identity. Um, and so... It was complicated, and actually I think there was a little turf war going on between Stanford and Harvard where the Stanford students were saying, how dare you, Harvard, let ROTC back on campus when you know they still discriminate against trans students? And, and the Harvard president was like, okay, duh, uh, all right. And, and ultimately it was an interesting uh, kind of fray between the two, but um, – it's important for people to know is that trans people can still be discriminated against in the military. Um, and the U S has not um, necessarily dealt with that issue. Um, so I don't know where we go from there, but um, you know, the, the, another topic that I think is also more important or also just as important, if not maybe a little bit more important is where we are with blood donations on our campus. Um, you know, it's, it's, yeah silly, arcane, stupid, I don't know what adjective to use, uh, but the fact that a homosexual person cannot give blood today on our college campuses, but yet we go to certain communities, I'm a fraternity man, so I can say this, Greeks, and we say, hey, guys, come and donate blood, right. because your blood's safer than the homosexual person who probably hasn't dated because there's no other homosexuals in rural Kansas to date. Um, so come on out. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, I just find that really stupid. And, and so we have other issues of discrimination. And, and sadly, people need blood. And so there's a lot of tests out there that screen for a lot of things. And so it's an old policy that really needs to be gotten rid of. Yeah. And I think a lot of campuses, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, it's, it's, it's on FDA. They're the ones, right, that, that have it out there. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and then you've got organizations, your Red Cross, et cetera, who have to abide by that. And so you've got folks protesting the Red Cross when really yeah. it's, it's at a federal level that it needs to be changed. And, and like you said, it's ridiculous, right? Well, as, a, as a straight guy, I could, I could have sex with like 70 people, <laughs> totally unprotected, and, well, and, and have just like the worst everything. But well, I was, if you're I a was, man who's yeah. had sex with a man since, what is it? What's, it's like 19 something. 80 rather. something, yeah. You, yeah if, around... you, if you check that box, sorry, we don't want your blood. The end. Well, and, and I actually. Yeah. Well, I actually ran into a student on a campus, and I, I told him to file a complaint about this, where the person 
who was doing the blood donations actually, because it's a small community, they actually knew that he was in the gay group on campus and he went up to donate blood and she's like, you can't donate blood. You have to check this box. And I, I was like, that's not supposed to happen. You're still supposed, you, you st- and he, he was turned away, which what yeah. happens is that you check the box. They still take your blood. They just don't use it. Really? That's, yeah, yeah. which is sort of saying, and again, I'm in the dark here. Hold on. I've got my, uh, <laughs> I need to get some lights in here. Stat. Um, this, is my, actually, this is my first East Coast afternoon show uh, after uh, Daylight Savings Time was eliminated or, or changed over. So, uh, yeah, I got to got to work on the lighting here. Otherwise, I look, it's like Student Affairs Live Halloween edition, a little spooky. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's a, a major issue. And I think a lot of campuses, there was, was at San Jose State for a while, their president had said, hey, we're no longer allowing blood donations and blood drives on our campus at one point. Yeah, which I don't think, I mean, I... I have my own personal opinions. Um, you know, I, I think we need to deal with some of these policies. I mean, realize realizing that they're oftentimes not in the control of the people who are doing the the blood. You know, um, and and same with ROTC. I mean, that was obviously a federal issue that had to be dealt with. Um, and, and the key is education. So, like at Indiana back in the day, um, I encouraged the students to pass out a slip that says, you know, something to the effect of. You know, if you are not able to donate blood, it still means that you can give in other ways. And and, and so that way people know that they're still human and that, you know, blood is very personal and it's something that you want to give blood because you want to give back. And so they need to know that there's other ways and that they're still human and, 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 and that, you know, what they're trying to do is still, you know, valid and it's still important. So there, the education component, I think, is what's important if you aren't able to change the policy right now. Well, let's let's speak about education for a second here before before the light completely goes away for me. Um, one of the, the things we talked about yesterday was the "It Gets Better" campaign, and how you know your quote I think yesterday was you're kind of a fan, sort of a fan, but you know it's not really something you see as being too influential. And as a side note, I think it was NC State's "It Gets Better" video that thing brought me to tears. That was one of the more impressive videos that I've seen. Yeah, um, you know, the It Gets Better project, um, the videos that have come out of it have been by far the, um, you know, the the most touching things that I've seen. And um, I tr- I really like the ones coming from the young people. Um, you know, the I, I'm a little bit jaded maybe when it comes from um, – uh, you know, some of the sports figures, um, you know, they've been doing It Gets Better. I think it's important that they do them, but it's become a little too corporate, a little too political, polished for me. Um, I like the old It Gets Better videos where it comes from the young people. Um, and I think it's important, you know, when It Gets Better was going on, uh, one of the, the big messages was, you know, just get out of high school and go to college and it gets better. Um, and I was just, you know, in shock, ready to just throw my computer across as if, the room. As if college is a, <laughs> a magical land of, of, of safety and awesome automatically. Yeah. And, you know, I think students are able to kind of create their own communities in college a little bit easier than um, maybe in high school. But at the same time, it doesn't just get better by going to college. It, it gets better by picking the right college that exercises and takes responsibility for its LGBT student populations. And, and that's the message that Campus Pride has been trying to get out there with the It Gets Better campaign and, uh, you know, trying to make it better through our, our programs and services. Well, I, I really appreciate what the work that you all do. And I know that you're speaking is, you know, the funds from your speaking directly go back to the organization, you know, because Campus Pride is a nonprofit uh, organization. So, you know, it's not about making a ton of money. It's about, you know, spreading the word uh, and sort of getting folks educated about LGBT issues and, and really advocating. So I think that uh, more folks need to know about Campus Pride because I think that the work that you all do is, is really important and it needs to continue for sure. Oh, thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. Well, Shane, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate, you know, we were all over the map, but I, I think at the end of the day here, the, the, the key theme is, you know what, we've still got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of advocacy efforts that need to take place and uh, we just got to keep talking to people and engaging in dialogue and i think you know we just have to make sure lady gaga doesn't come anytime soon to most of our campuses because we still have a you know there's still some institutional things we need to make happen so absolutely if she comes in on her disco stick <laughs> we're, we're in big trouble we're in trouble right now <laughs> 
All right, Shane, thanks for coming on the show. All right, have a great day, All right. Thanks. All right, folks, that was Shane Winmeyer of Campus Pride. He has all sorts of goodness going on when it comes to his work uh, around LGBT advocacy and education. Uh, like I said, he's with Campus Pride. He speaks all over the place. The guy's schedule is ridiculous. He's pretty much in a new city every other day. Speaking of every other day, usually we have a show every week. But because of my travel schedule, we're not going to have a show next week. So on November 30th, we're going to have what I'm calling the Cast 2.0 special. That's right, the Council for the Advancement of Standards. The president of Cast, Laura Dean, a.k.a. the keeper of Cast, and I'm not going to call her Mama Cast because I'm probably getting in trouble, even though I just sort of did. So here's the thing. She's going to come on. We're going to talk about technology and how it relates to the Cast standards. And so uh, November 30th, mark your calendars. November 30th, Cast standards is going to be amazing. And I think it's going to be a conversation that really needs to happen around what's going on with CAS because uh, nobody's really talking about CAS. And so I think it's, it's, it's important for sure. So, folks, I want to give a quick shout out again to our sponsor because we are commercial free on Ustream because of Integral. And Integral are the creators of the Schools app on Facebook. Make sure you check out their webinar series about how they can help you leverage Facebook to increase yield and retention. And it's really cool, so please check it out. And that happens, the webinar happens this fr uh, Wednesday, actually, so next week, next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. And Rachel, who has been ferociously, fiercely tweeting as Higher Life throughout the show, uh, will put that out here in a moment. So, folks, my name is Eric Stoller. This has been Student Affairs Live, and we will see you in a couple of weeks, November 30th, the CAS 2.0 Special Extraordinaire. Take care.